from wherever you are watching. Welcome to the very first edition of the Faces of South Sudan here on the City Review uh, Digital. And today we have got uh, one guest who has got a lot of stories to share with us. Um, happy to introduce Mr. Manyan Kerr. Thank you. Um, he'll tell us his uh, connection between South Sudan and uh, Ethiopia. He will also take us to Khartoum, to Australia just to talk about 734 coffee and as well as uh, 734 water there's a, of course there's a lot that he has to share with us but first of all we'd like to get to know just who is he how old is he where was he born where was he raised and how did he come to become the how, how did he end up did he end up being the founder of 734 coffee so for that and more uh welcome on board now to my guest uh, welcome to this is the very first edition of uh, the Faces of South Sudan. We intend okay. to make it a weekly okay. segment. And um, the first question that our viewers um, would like to uh, he uh, hear, yeah. uh, the kind of answer that they want is, who is Manyang? Before we get to 734 <laughs> Coffee. Um, uh, my name is Manyang Kerr, uh, Red Kerr. I'm born in the Zhongli state, uh, which is uh, a small part of the area called Akobo. Um, early on, we were um, chased to be a refugee and we were traveling from, because of the Sudanese civil war. So we were refugees. Uh, most of the people here, even are, you know, everybody here in this um, more, half of the population has gone to Ethiopia at some point because um, that's when we um, talking about our struggle and stuff like that so Ethiopia become a service face uh, serve heaven for us at, at some level and so some of us stay there and we were there and then uh, I got the opportunity to go to America um, for the uh, better education better life and stuff like that um, and so I went to education, to education, so it's I I've done my education there. Um, but the idea of being abroad uh, is always like people asking you, oh, send me this, send me that, stuff like that. And you feel a way, what, how can you help people in the homeland, you know, how can you help them with the product that they have. Um, and so we started UMAN Helping Sudan. Uh, the UMAN Helping Sudan idea was to uh, just help people help themselves. You know, how do you help people help themselves? Maybe help them through farming, through all this stuff. And so you meant helping Sudan was started and then we bring all this celebrity to like Africa and then they talk about humanitarian crisis in like um, Sudanese, South Sudanese humanitarian crisis in Gambela and then, you know, Kenya and all that stuff. And so it become the way to tell our story better than so American people can listen to it more. And then uh, you meant helping Sudan been there for that for that long. And then um, when we get into the farming, and then we decide that we actually need to sell coffee because most of our farmer are coffee farmer. And who do we ask to sell coffee for? Um, so we didn't have a way to sell the coffee. We didn't have a way to. Um, big company are not coming all the way to like border of South Sudan to pick up the coffee. They, they, they don't. They just go to like auction area. They take their coffee and they leave it alone. And so if you really want to help the local population there, you may come up with a different solution. And so we call the coffee 734, which was my refugee camp. And so we don't want to call it refugee. We call it seven. 34, 7 north, 34 east. You know, the altitude and latitude, the coordinate of Gambela, the region where um, uh, we get the, where they have a lot of refugees. And that also, that, that place become a home for many, many people, many, many Sudanese refugees. And so we want to tell the story that way. And so that's how the company come about, the 734 coffee, uh, that's where it was born, yeah. <clears throat> Maybe take us through the years. At what point did you realize that there was war going on around you and uh, that movement from your home 
to Gambela, maybe could take us through in your um, through your eyes how you are seeing things unfolding. No, at some point in this country, since 1980, most people run out of bordering country. We are the only place in East Africa that most of our people just run. You run the place close to you. Like if you are close to Chad, you went to Chad. If you are close to Kenya, you go to Kenya. If you are close to Uganda, you go to Uganda. Me being in Jongle in that area, most of our people go through go through Utopia, and that is early uh, early eighties. You know, the um, like late eighties and and thing like that. So some of us came back during the Delgi regime and thing like that. But you know, some of us also stay um, in. In, in Ethiopia, which lead up us, some of us end up going to America, mm. and so yeah. So how old were you, maybe, when you, you and your family? And I was very young. I was basically, I was very young, and probably about four, three years old, about four or five years old. So it was, I was very young. So but uh, four years meaning, even the moment the memory could not be as accurate because given your age. No, is it, we, we, is it, to be honest with you, we don't have a bus there like that. So you just know like, okay, around 88, that's when you are born, or you know, like that's when you know, like, you know, like, I, I don't know, I never really know my exact birthday, you know, <laughs> like, 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 yeah, I celebrate a birthday that was, uh, tracked on to me when I go to America and stuff like that. But I, I, I didn't, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly okay. don't know. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. So when you get, when you got to know who was around you, your parents were all there? Or? No, no, no. So, so, you know, we were separated. You know, like you said, my, my, my family were in the, in like, cause, you know, this is a weird thing and it become crazy. Most people, they push the kid up and they will remain blind. When there's war, in, 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 it become today, when there was war in, in Sudan, they push the, the children and basically what they try and do is they push them to 30 so they can remain blind because they were hoping that this war would be finished and then when the kid are served, they can bring them back. It didn't end up that way. So people end up going to Ethiopia and be refugee, which is you know, this migration of the children that are called the lost boy, which were the group that we end up being put at, at the camp. Okay. And so, yeah, and that's what they call the, the name. We don't call ourselves lost boy, but in America, that's a, that's a name they known us for. Okay. You know, that's a name that they give us to this group of kids that was in refugee camp. And, right. uh, so, so, yeah, it, it, it's not a very good name, a condemnation, because it seemed like, um, so, so, so when I'm talking to Sudanese audience, it didn't really feel, it's not an honor, it didn't feel mm -hmm. right to say, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm old now, I can't be lost away anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I've read, I've read about it because yeah. we were also doing some analysis, yeah. especially on the SPLA day. Yeah. Uh, I also had to, we had to write some literature about it. Yeah. But then, of course, being in a refugee camp, by all standard, yeah. it has never been a fancy thing. It's not. Mm. It's not. Because you eat one time a day, and then you depend on, and then the healthcare, you know, the, the, all those things, you have all these challenges. You know, your healthcare is not good, your food situation is not good. You know, like it's a kind of strong survival situation. You know, the people die of cholera. I mean, people that die in cholera, people kill themselves in, in, in those areas. That's a disease that was catching people in the hand. Uh, I don't know, they, they have a name for it, but it's like this uh, because of dirty water and stuff like that. It decolorizes the skin? It's like, yeah, it is a skin disease. It, it was in your hand. It would also be in, it was a, there was a disease, the outbreak that was, that has damaged a lot of people, even hand, leg, stuff like that. It even also blind some people. Mm -hmm. um, and because there's no proper health and the genes that you have in refugee camp. It, 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 you know, it's a, 
you know, a few few falls are by. After yeah. this day, they still have some some kind of situation, some disease that can trust back to to those early time. You know, so so in seven thirty four, this is how many camps did you have? Because this is about the coordinates. Right? Yeah, yeah. So so the idea was to tell our story. We I feel like we owe this place called Gambella a lot of. Uh, a lot of things because this is the only place that hosts half of our population in South Sudan. At one point, it hosts half of the population. You know, even all the SPLA general, half of the bigger guy now that were there, they will tell you they were in, in, in that camp. Okay. They, they went to that camp. You know, they all tell you that. Um, it has hosted a lot of people. It has given us opportunity to come back to this country. And so I feel like I want to name, like, okay, the word Bill Palm is also derived from Gambela, actually. If you do, Bill Palm is a place in Gambela. Okay. So if you hear Bill Palm, something like it's another word for a small particular place in Gambela. And so um, that's the same thing we try and do, but we don't want to get into to particular name. We just want to say geographical call, that area. You know, okay. the border of Sudan, the border of South Sudan and Ethiopia. Yeah. And that's where we want to focus on, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So before maybe get to um, your entry into coffee business. Yeah. Uh, I'll be int I'm interested to know how it was like acquiring education. Uh, we've read from multiple sources, um, especially for those who are not there to experience one-on-one um, -on -one what was going on that um, having, um, acquiring education was a big challenge yeah. because of the massive yeah. numbers no, yeah. which overstretched what even the government of Ethiopia could provide. How was it like acquiring education? Well, we, we, we have the education that you can get from the UN. So UNHCR, part of the uh, refugee agency, were helping refugees. They give them the basic need of education, helping them with uh, stuff like that. So, you know, some people survive in that education, some people give up, some people went through, and that's just part of life. Um, and so, how part of us, why, and you know, to, to, you have to be grateful. Even the reason some of us end up going to the West is because you become learning about the West, the best education you could have, and all that stuff. You know, I went to America, in part, I want to have a better education. Um, you know, better understanding of the world, and, and that's what I did. So I went to uh, college, to college. Now, now I teach uh, at George Mason University. I teach human rights at, at, at George Mason University. I could not have um, done that if I stay in refugee camp. Okay. You know, I, I could not be able to do that. And as, you know, so those, those things is, is opportunity that, you know, I'm sure you have to fight for them to come to you, but you know, but this, they have to be there as an opportunity, you know. So I want to be an international lawyer so I can actually, like, if I work with UN or I did something, with, I can interview people, yeah. they can have a process. I can help somebody now if I want to, let's say, okay, this person is doing this, this. So I, I, ha I have a, the power to say, this person need to be in this part of the world because he can do A, B, C, D, you know. And those things come with education. My education background will back that. Yeah. And without a doubt, it will be internationally respected. And, you know, versus somebody that just walk on the street and say, you smart. You know, like, uh, this is not the expert smart. If I say you smart, my, I have a validation of why you are, you know. And those things can co only come with education. And I like the fact that I can teach, you know, like, um, teaching in, uh, in college or being open my law firm or, or being in is, is something excited for me because uh, you know like I grow up I want to open my own law firm you know I just end up being into business which is later in life you know I want to do two things I want to be uh, um, I want to be like what I'm doing I'm, t I'm teaching at George Mason University but I also eventually I want to have my own uh, law firm so they come to me because, you know, I started Human Talking Sudan. And then we get this farmer. And then they end up, we end up having a coffee farmer. And then now, 
how do we change their life if they only grow coffee? So we're trying to bring international coffee to buy. They don't want to come to that area. It's like too much negotiation. So we end up being the caretaker of creating a coffee company, you know? And then the idea would be we will help farmer, local farmer, have a better life by buying the coffee from them. And then on top of it, we also help refugee with education system, like sending kids to school with scholarship program. Instead of just trying to base it on somebody else, uh, we're asking for somebody else, you know, we, we, we be the one, and we call it 734, because those are the area, um, this from South Sudan to, from South Sudan. So now we stretch it like all the border of South Sudan, you know, all the border, like it will include Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia. So those are those border areas where we can take the coffee from. And the reason for that is because those border have always been, a ref they has always had the refugees. So as a refugee, you don't have all the papers. So you partner with a local, this like local give you opportunity to get your, uh, say, you know, coffee can be illegal quickly. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a part where, you know, if we talk about the coffee process and how it become illegal and stuff, I can't just take the coffee in the middle of Yambio right now and sell it because they don't have a number, they don't have a code, PLU, all that stuff you need them to have to be legally registered. South Sudan is a country now, they don't recognize coffee. We, we don't, and I don't say we don't, like we don't, we own the country that didn't recognize coffee as a product. So we don't have a PLU for that. Like I can't take coffee from South Sudan without having to coordinated with Uganda counterpart or Ethiopian counterpart to allow us to give us a code, you know, because you can't take coffee from South Sudan directly. You just order on our website, you have an office, we bring the coffee, we make the coffee for the office, uh, kitchen, all this stuff. So we prepare for all those things. Okay. So yeah, as much as you need it, yeah. You process it a bit? Or you said no, we as greens? No, we have to make, take it green because uh, there's a, a, a U.S. government called uh, USDA. Um, so when you take it like a small, small, it's not good. You have to take it like a ball, like a big, in a container. And so they can, uh, they can like look it. It's, it's like a coffee and then, and then you allow to, we bag it over there so it make us local and also we get the, um, being a local company also there as well. Okay, and where is your, where is your business registered? Is it in it, Sudan or is it in South no, Sudan? No, 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 we are, we are actual American uh, business, but what we're trying to do now is we eventually, our goal would be, our headquarters will be either Sudan or will be moved to South Sudan. And then we will just also like, then the way it's gonna work is, we're just gonna also like send a team to wherever they need the coffee um, and then we like, you know, like the coffee from South Sudan or the coffee from Sudan, you know, so um, we want to be the coffee from Sudan. So if you want to uh, coffee from South Sudan and Sudan, so if you want to order coffee from there, it will be 734. That's the, that's the goal that we're working on right now. Okay. Um, and so um, right now, both you and your partner, are based in the US or it's you? Yeah, it's 734, the warehouse and the staff and everybody based in the US right now. Our headquarters in Northern Virginia, uh, which is um, 30 minutes away from Washington, DC. Uh, we supply DC area and New York, and also we have a, a partner coffee shop in San Francisco and stuff like that. So the, our customer part has been um, West, you know, bring the coffee. Only now we're focusing, we, we're coming back to East Africa to try okay. and sell our brands and because we feel like, you know, the, something inspired me and I, this is something that is very inspiring to me. I, I, um, uh, somebody take me to this movie called uh, The Cocoa I Never Test. It's, in, it's based in West Africa. Hmm. It's based, still based in West Africa. You have this farmer, they never tested cocoa all their life. And the cocoa went to the West and people just 
uh, eat the cocoa there, they make a lot of money with it. And then the farmer that actually grow the cocoa, they never tested it. And then it, it, it inspired me so much to say that, I don't want to do the same thing. Now, I want to actually have a coffee in, in Juba, South Sudan. I also want to have a coffee in, in, in Ethiopia. I also want to have coffee in, in Khartoum. Yeah. And so the people, the farmer can actually sometime, if they want to see the coffee, they can drink it there. Mm -hmm. And that excitement will also be important for us to, to promote. You know, okay. like, um, you never see people excited when I call them from here and I tell them, hey, it seemed like, um, like two days ago, I talked to somebody in Oregon, uh, 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 Oregon in, in, in the west of uh, America. So somebody called me trying to get a coffee replacement. So when I called them, I say, I call you from Juba. It was surprising shock, you know, the idea of having a connection with somebody that they feel like they just get the coffee from Juba right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah they, they were like, oh, you called me all the way from Juba? This is a coffee I like, you know. <laughs> yeah, this, this is the kind of coffee I want because the coffee from Juba is, is this guy called me all the way. This, this was the bigger thing. This was the bigger sell for us to say that, you know, to call the guy and say, I call you all the way from Juba. From Juba. And, and for them, it, it was because in their head, this is, this is too far for somebody to call me all the way like that. You know, this is what he want. You need to have business with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is that is quite that, yeah. is, that is quite something. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you give out eighty percent of the profits back. Yes, we okay. Th oh. This has been twisted a bit, you know. Eighty mm. percent because we we part of our charity we have a scholarship program that we created. Mm -hmm. So in that program we have a coffee that we sell for a specific program. So eighty percent of that sell, eighty percent of the cell goes to scholarship program. But this is not like, because sometimes it gets twisted in, in a different term, like all the 734, all the cell, 80% goes, no, no, it's not that. We have a scholarship program that we created it, but it's funded by 734. Mm -hmm. And so we have, um, so people signed up now, these this people, they, they subscription is a subscription base actually. Mm -hmm. These the people that buy every year. This is subscription model. They're not just like a regular buyer. This is a different group of people. They say, you know what? I want to buy coffee, but percentage of my money also help on this. So they buy fully a year. You know, the, the, it's like a subscription for one year, and then you renew it again if you want to continue it. Okay. But you get coffee every month. And that, is called, and that is subscription model, 80% of that goes uh, to, the, to the scholarship program. So, how many people have been reached we, through, we, uh, yeah? through this initiative? We have, we have 10 kids now in college. And 10. So 10, 10, mm. 10, yeah. So, we're hoping eventually the goal would be to put up to 50. But, you know, right now is a, a good start because, you know, like mm. the, it's a four year program. So, you need to go slowly as, as, you know. These kids in college, that is the university? University, university, yeah. Juba or? No, it's not. Uh, some of them are in Kenya, some of them are in Ethiopia, and we have um, uh, different cases, like two in, Su in, in Su Sudan. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we're going to end up, half of it would be in Kenya and Ethiopia, and then also Sudan, even if we open a coffee shop here. Okay. But yeah, but this is, this is where we started, the base of Ethiopia. That's where we start the whole thing there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that you want to bring the business to the office to Juba. Yeah, yeah. Um, how long will that take? Well, it's a lot of work. It's a process, and we also want to know that is it, um, you know, if we bring our headquarters. Because my goal, like, really, what inspired me again is to say that we are South Sudan, like you say, serve the children from where it's Sweden or serve the children. Oh, yeah. We want to say 734. South Sudan, you know, yeah. and so we're coming like when, when children are happy in Australia because we supply education or we give them coffee. When the um, people in Washington DC, they drink our coffee. I want them to know this, our headquarter is in uh, Yuba, South Sudan, even though we have office in New York or, or Northern Virginia, all this, the idea of us, the, the idea of reverse psychology of us going to help people, not 
everybody just coming to help us is what inspired me the most. It's actually what I really want to bring the office uh, up for. But you know, it's not like you just say one day it's gonna do it, tech resources. Um, so you have to work on how do you do it and without having to hurt the business, you know, like, you know, like, uh, oh, yeah. this thing like that, so. Okay, great. Then you mentioned that you also uh, plan to venture into water, but. We actually have a water company now. We opened a water company here in Juba, South Sudan in Agos, 734 Water. So you can actually order our water, bring 734 Water, we have it. Um, so uh, we were lucky enough, we were on the MTN uh, a few months back, and so you get the message, take the 734 Water, so it's excited we are. Um, so we, 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 we are, we, you know, like we, we've been promoting 734 water. The water factory is under the Minister of Humanitarian. So we have uh, been working since uh, September of last year. And so we supply water to companies. So that's, that's what we want to do.